Well, we finished uh, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic around uh, mid-2003, and then uh, we did the PC version, but through the last half of 2003, we were starting to really think about what we wanted to do next. And uh, in general, we, we wanted to take what we had done with Knights of the Old Republic, and which was a huge space adventure. You go to a lot of different planets, and uh, it's in the Star Wars universe, so you've got... Uh, you know, just a good basis for adventure and combat and things like that. Um, and we wanted to take the formula that we brought to that kind of role-playing game experience, where you can create a character, be who you want to be, and really develop that character over the course of a game, and, and take that into a new universe where there was really no limits on what you could do as a character and what we could do with a story. And so that meant basically coming up with our own intellectual property, our own galaxy, universe of new spaceships and new powers and things like that, um, just a really uh, a, a fresh look at how to do a space adventure. The origins of the story for Mass Effect really come from the, uh, the principles of, of the world that we wanted to create. And, and actually, when you think about um, issues like, should you have time travel? Should you be able to warp somewhere? Is there cloning? Is there uh, artificial intelligence that, you know, there are robots that you know, are, are as smart as we are. Those kinds of things actually dictate the things that you can do in the story. Because if you can do time travel, or even if you can warp across the battlefield, you know, that, that radically changes everything about your story, the way the game plays, everything. So um, we had to kind of lock those things down first before we started building our story. And then the story itself came from, again, the larger ideals of what kind of moments do you want to have and what do you want to be able to do. So we wanted the player to be able to have their own ship, just because that's, that's a great way to feel empowered and be able to get around the galaxy. We also wanted it to be a ship that um, wasn't just a vehicle that you hopped into. We wanted it to feel kind of more important. And so it's an actual military vessel that has a crew. And as you do different things on, on missions and all across the game, your crew actually responds to you. And you can go up and talk to them. You can walk around inside the ship. And you can decide where you want to go. And so. It's these kinds of things that kind of started contributing to what the basic structure of the story was. When we write something at Bioware, there's usually three, four writers on any given time working together uh, on a project, maybe six, seven writers across the whole life of the project. We also take input from all the other um, people on the project. You know, the artists help you get, understand what the vision of the game is going to be. Um, the programmers give you an understanding of what the gameplay is going to be. Um, your character artists show you the characters you're writing for. You see them coming to life. The animators make them real. Uh, and everybody has a, an understanding of what we want the final product to be. Uh, when we're designing characters, there's you know, input from everywhere. Beginning with story, uh, the writers are going to write, uh, you know, we need to know who's, who's in the world and what they're doing, where everyone's going, what their motivation is. That's, absolutely essential when it comes to character design. If you don't have a story, there's no point in drawing. They say a picture says a thousand words, but yeah, it's, it says way more than that. I, I've tried writing a thousand words and I usually end up scribbling notes in the side anyway, scribbling designs and, and drawing. To me, storytelling is the most important aspect. If you haven't told your story right and you've ended up wasting the whole audience's time, really it's a about taking people to places they, they haven't been before. Well, one of the first steps we do is we uh, usually start just uh, looking through a lot of photographs, find stuff that is actually on Earth that is interesting, uh, start painting concepts around there. We'll do a couple of planet ideas, maybe 5 to 15 to 20. Uh, you know, maybe do a little rocky environment, maybe garbage planet, anything like that. I mean, just throw it out there. Let the writers start to look at some of these ideas, let them pick and choose about ones they, they can uh, really work with. Uh, one of the areas we did was uh, Vera Meyer, which was kind of based on some islands in Vietnam, and uh, Thailand, we really worked with that with these kind of uh, clean pads that kind of connected them all together you could walk through. Originally the concept started out as this uh, uh, utopian uh, uh, a vacation world that was very clean, you'd want to go to, a, eventually it was turned into an evil base, but <laughs> we had to do some adjustments on that one. To create an environment, we start with the, the concept that Derek Watts creates, and we, we work with the designers to rough in a block level of the set to, to make sure it fits the needs of all the design and story requirements for the area. So we build a lot of the stuff the same way we did in our past generation games. Uh, we still construct them in Studio Max. We 
pull them into or you know display them with our with our engine there's just a lot less restrictions on things for for this generation we can have a lot more polys a lot more textures higher texture resolutions it all holds up a lot better than it did um, and the artists are, are free to make it look exactly like what they wanted from there we move on and we start applying textures and lighting and everything else to refine it and make sure it's believable. Lighting, especially in Mass Effect, is incredibly important. It's one of our, our big focuses. After everything is looking and acting correctly in our, uh, in our game and the designers are comfortable with how things are working, we spend a lot of time on trying to get the lighting just right, um, making sure that the, the colors are controlled and that they hold up well, that they match our, our style and our art direction. Mass Effect is actually structured in a way that allows us to, you know, not only have you know, sequels that extend the, the, the main story in ways that we've actually planned out ahead of time. But it also has the basis for a larger galaxy outside the core story that's constantly ex expanding. So um, we do this through what we call Uncharted Worlds. And so in the game you actually have a starship. You can go to the galaxy map in the center of the ship and you can actually look at the galaxy, look down on it look at all the different star clusters and kind of explore planets and asteroids and things and then you can actually go to these places. We add creatures, we add uh, things like bases or maybe lost satellites or something that you would want to, that, that whatever it is that you saw in orbit that beckoned you to, to, to come to and explore this place and that's some sort of anomaly. You could, it could, you could be set up for an ambush by some other race in the game. You, there could be um, minerals there to explore and recover. Um, and these are basically unclaimed planets, so there could be new creatures nowhere else in the game. Uh, those are the sorts of things you'd encounter on an uncharted world. If you were actually able to have your ideal adventure in space, what would you want to do? Have your own starship, have some kind of superhuman abilities, um, be put in a, in a position where you as a character are somehow empowered, even beyond where you can grow in a normal RPG, but even that your starting point puts you in a position where the kinds of things you're dealing with are really epic. And so that, those are some of the principles that helped us form the basis for what, what the intellectual property would be, what the universe would be. We get the concept artist uh, started quite early on uh, characters. We give them a rough idea of what we want, uh, some people to try and think of, medics, uh, marines, uh, armors, uh, ambient characters. So Matt Rhodes did these. These were some uh, sketches he did to get an early idea of what we wanted. It's a futuristic look, but still clean and stylish. He'll look through uh, uh, fashion magazines uh, and so on. We kind of wanted to get these arcs in there on the clothing. He was playing around a bit with that. Uh, the clothing is quite tight. These are maybe some ideas of formal wear for uh, the humans. Uh, this is a quick uh, early drawing of maybe what an Asari head looks like. Character design for Mass Effect was, was great. Um, it really was wish fulfillment in that we were able to design a whole, well, plethora, for you know, lack of a better word, of just you know, new, new aliens, new, new species that, that we could really just play at and have, have our own fun with. There were the humans. And the idea behind, behind designing the human race in this game was that it wasn't that far in the future. Far enough, far enough that it was something new, but not so far that it was unrecognizable, that it was, that it was alien to us. Having the chance to design new aliens in particular, there were aliens like the Salarians, for example. The Salarians were um, actually one of the easiest to design, in a way. Some of the first drawings kind of seemed to hit it um, fairly close, and it was just a matter of sort of finesse, just back and forth, trying to find out where do we relax, or where, where, where is it, what's, what are we trying to say with these guys? In some ways we base them a little bit on, at least from a design point, um, a little bit of the Japanese uh, sort of poet warrior uh, persona. Uh, the Krogans are, are badasses. They're the warriors, they're the guys who are running through the galaxy, pushing everyone around. Intimidating, everything in there, even their physiology says, we are going to kick your ass. The Asari were the most fun to design, by far. Uh, to get a design brief that basically says, design blue skin space babes with no men, um, it's like, all right, good, can do. A lot of the inspiration from the Asari came from, especially in, in costumes, came from uh, sports gear. There was a lot of uh, scuba gear and climbing gear and a lot of that, a lot of stuff that was really pliable, really flexible. It, it was every nerd's design dream. The Turians would be the warlords. They're the guys who are probably, when humans show up, they're the best of the best. They're the ones who are the scariest and the most together. Um, like a mix between, a mix between the Krogan and Solarian in a way, but just point here. 
The design of the Geth was probably one of the longest character designs that we dealt with. He was on the table the longest. Um, it started out not even as a machine very early on. It wasn't, it wasn't, they weren't a machine race. And this was before a story sort of, you know, was, was written about them. Um, but there was one sketch in particular that, that ended up latching on, that people latched onto. Did a drawing of a guy with them, uh, almost with no skin, but like Bishop from Aliens with his like white plastic insides. Um, but basically just a muscle chart clinging to the walls in this creepy spider pose. People just kept coming back to that and saying like, can we have this? Can we have this in, in the game? And slowly but surely as time went along, we thought, well, you know, this, this, this living creature geth isn't really working out that well. It might maybe, maybe machines, you know, that, that might actually serve a bit better. And that's when the design process really started going. Um, the, original, the original design for the geth was based kind of on a human, the, the white plastic muscle one. Um, but eventually we started to twist him and, and push around and you know, try to get a few more of those alien features, some of that stuff that really uh, you know, sets you off and makes you really uncomfortable. So we got rid of the head, um, you know, gave him the big sort of hood tube over, over, his, over his face and just gave him some of that anatomy that just makes you a little unsettling. But the one thing we knew we ended up having to keep was, was especially the, the musculature. Something that seems very much like uh, he's been skinned and that he's, he's not, not, not cozy at all. He's not enjoying his life. Um, the Geth in particular uh, were great to design. It was fun to design, but after the end of it, none of us wanted to see them again. Uh, here I've just got uh, a Geth trooper that I'm working on. Uh, we're just uh, basically setting up some, some level of detail meshes. Uh, you can also notice uh, in here the green and blue is uh, the character rig that the, the animators will use to pose the character. This guy is approximately 5 million polygons, and so there's a lot of surface detail, and uh, you can see all the, the, the wrinkles and folds and anatomical elements and all the intricacies behind the modeling there that gets brought into the game and gives the models the, the great surface treatment, uh, the weight of the light, how it plays over the surface. Um, in previous generations, we were looking at poly counts of maybe 1,000, 2,000 polygons for the heads. So there's a tremendous difference between what the Xbox 360 is capable of uh, compared to the, for the previous generation. One of the guys that actually wrote the story is our music map maker. Okay, so along with the levels and what's going on in the levels, we, we have a music map that, that will define um, you know, changes in music as, as the story changes. Certain story moments are going to have very critical music that you'll only hear in that point in the story. And then other, other times we'll take, uh, you know, the general level music that, that you typically hear while you're just exploring the world. That will be, it's going to be extended in a way that the music will, will sound different even if you decide to come back. The music will sound familiar, but it'll be different. Back in the days before we had all this digital technology, the guys only had tape. You know, they had tape decks. And the only thing they could really do is a little bit of pitch here and there, manipulate the tape deck, slow it down, speed it up. And so they had to be really creative in how they actually recorded those sounds. So a lot of the things that uh, somebody like Ben Burt would do is he would go out in the field. I'm sure everybody's seen the videos of him tapping the tension wires to make the laser zap sounds. And, and the, one, the one thing that I found the most fascinating, the way that he got a lot of the ship sounds was he went to the Los Angeles freeway, pointed a vacuum cleaner tube at the, the freeway, stuck his mic in the vacuum cleaner tube, and then all of a sudden the sound got really focused and it had this pitch to it because much like a flute, a vacuum cleaner tube, you know, the pitch is, is defined by the length of the tube. So he was trying different pitches till he got the sound he want. And then once it's on tape, he could manipulate it and speed it up, slow it down, and that's how he got a lot of the ship sounds, just by getting freeway noises modified at the source. And so that's the type of thing we're trying to do, is go out and record our ambiences, but modify them at the source, so that when we're not doing a lot of digital post-processing, a lot of times it's all about happy accidents, you know? You, you, in your mind you'll say, okay, well, I think the sound will come out like this, but until you try it, and it's like, wait a second, that's really neat, that's really unusual, that sound there, and then you can manipulate a little bit digitally and get it into the game. One thing that we found is that in the national parks, there's some, I don't know if people, have, if, if they have them everywhere, but I know in our national parks in Alberta, we have bear-proof garbage cans. Okay, so what they are is these garbage cans, the lid lifts up, and you know, it's got a hinge on it, and then there's a little latch that locks so the bears can't get in and steal the garbage. And so those are, those are everywhere in our national parks. And basically, but those, those garbage cans are quite big, and they've got these big, rackety, you know, rusty hinges because they're outside all the time. And so we found this one that we were just 
goofing around, stuck microphones in it. We're, you know, lifting the lid and it's making all these groaning and moaning noises. And then after we, we you know, we're just like, oh, whatever, it sounds okay. And then we bring it back. We pitched it down about an octave, added a little bit of reverb to it. And all of a sudden, wait a sec. <laughs> That sounds like the inside of some, you know, alien vessel, and it's and it's just all these groaning and moanings and stuff. And and actually, what uh, that turned into be is actually going to be the sovereign sound. So it's the, you know, that's probably I would say the single most defining sound is that one particular sound. It's in the trailers, so I mean it's been floating around a bit, but it's but that is the sound of sovereign. And what it is 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 just a garbage can lid. There we go. So we got the before and after. So basically, the before was just. It's just this, it's you know, a garbage can lid being uh, manipulated. And then the after, turn into that, which is our, our money sound. <laughs> That's probably the, that, I guess that would be the single, the single proudest sound in the game because it was a happy accident. And, and that's really just a garbage can lid pitched down an octave with a little bit of reverb on it to, to liven it up. We really kind of have three portions to the design department. There's the, the writers who do all the story. There's the cinematic designers, which mostly uh, make our, our dialogues and some of our cutscenes very, very cinematic. They're, they're responsible for making that look. And then everything else, all the collection together, is, uh, is what the tech designers do. We take all the resources from every other department and we script all the combats and script everything together. We do most of our work in Kismet, um, which is a visual scripting language. Uh, sometimes it can get kind of crazy, a little complex. Like, for example, this is the, the innards of this action station that I'm talking about, which is kind of where the uh, intelligence is for uh, what kind of twitches. You know, there's a lot of logic flowing through all these and saying what twitches the guy might do when he's in this uh, station. We have three different classes that all, three different types of combat classes that uh, all deploy different powers and abilities. And it's how those, all that stuff comes together into a combination that we're hoping really creates a lot of really cool, fun gameplay for the player. The animators, they have mocap for all of their scenes and they tend to um, spend a lot of time on the very key scenes that, uh, that take a lot of work. And what we do is we actually work with the existing animations that we have and try to basically through camera trickery and a whole lot of uh, kind of behind the scenes, slate of hand work, make it look like something new. One of the things we, we tried really hard to do in Mass Effect is to allow uh, our designers and our artists to, to uh, be able to create the kind of uh, NPCs that they, they want to, uh, simply with a few, you know, a few sliders and a, and a few presses of the button. Uh, you know, for example, just, just one slider to control the skin tone. Uh, we can tint uh, uh, the color of the, the bone. Basically, we, we've, we've got a lot of, 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 of different things we can do. Along with the materials, we're also able to control uh, all the features of, of the face. So, for example, we can, we can adjust the, the height of the eye. Uh, we can adjust the, you know, the width. Uh, we, can, we can pretty much pick any of the features we've, we've decided to, to uh, allow customization on. And, uh, and really, we can, we can do quite a bit with it. Unlike uh, previous games I've worked on, we, we were really close with the character designers right from the start of the game. Uh, when we're creating the rigs for every single creature, they'll typically send us all the concepts, and us being animators and production, and anybody that's going to be involved in bringing the characters to life, which covers a lot of disciplines. And we all have sign-off on it. We all, we're all able to say things like, to, uh, animators will be able to say, oh, that if the arm was to lift up there, then the character will break at this point. So we're able to catch all that as they're making the concepts, and then they'll move on to the next stage where they'll actually create a, a low-res model, and then we can actually stick that in the game and start playing around with it and try and find out all the iron out all the flaws with it before they go into doing the high detail meshes. This here is the character. You'll see that we make sure we have the eyes turned on here, and if I was to simply turn the eyes off. You see the difference in how much the character looks alive. This is what we typically expect <laughs> in games. We always try to build in layers of depth. And so there's, there's always the core story. And then we also have side plots. And, and part of the interest in the side plot is that you don't have to do it, which usually something that you don't have to do is, is therefore even more tempting. And uh, with Mass Effect, we kind of took it even further. And then we actually added places 
on the map that are outside even, even the plots that you know about, even if they're side plots, there's still other places for you to go. So again, it kind of, it kind of adds to what you can do if you want to. But even if you choose not to do the additional side plots or go and explore the, the extra worlds and, and asteroids and things that are out there in the galaxy, it actually just you know, makes the, the main story more interesting because you know that that main story is set inside a larger galaxy. So um, just the fact that you can go past something and say, no, I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm not going to go there. I am going to stick to the main story. That little choice kind of reinforces the fact that you have freedom in this game.